Well, um, I'd like to um, thank Rashad and Noam for this warm welcome and uh, the Jewish Studies faculty for inviting us. It's a true honor to be presenting this room lectures. It's a lectureship that I've uh, been hearing a lot about and read many of the books and uh, it was a delight to be invited uh, to be with you tonight. So this is the first of two lectures and um, we'll tell you a little bit about both of them. It's part of a new project as uh, Noam indicated. So what you see here is a relatively old class photograph and it's dated circa 1900. It was taken at an unidentified school in Chernovitz, which is the capital of the Bukovina, the easternmost province of the Austro-Habsburg Empire. Uh, it's a picture that was posted on a website that's uh, devoted to the historical, cultural, and ge genealogical research on this city, which was once a largely Jewish and predominantly German-speaking city and region. Um, and um, the photo's caption identifies only one boy on the picture, Adolf Blond, standing in the back row extreme right. Born in 1892, that boy, we learned from the accompanying text, would survive imprisonment in the Buchenwald concentration camp during the Second World War and eventually uh, was able to immigrate to England. The photo appears in a small collection on the website's folder um, dedicated to pre-1945 photographs and it was a collection that was donated by Arthur Rindner who the text tells us was a distant relative of Adolf Blond's and who had become the custodian of these orphaned family images. So the image of Adolf Blond is by no means extraordinary. In overall appearance, in arrangement, and style, this photo of Blond's class largely conforms to class pictures snapped elsewhere throughout the world, both in earlier and later moments in time, and I'm sure all of you have a number of these in your albums, probably in your family albums, because that's where we tend to put our class photos. And I can bet that you haven't spent a, long, a lot of time really thinking about these as a genre. It's a vernacular photographic genre that doesn't attract a lot of attention. But so despite their ubiquitous presence in most of our lives um, and in our family albums, but maybe because of this ubiquity, school photos are generally considered unremarkable objects, images that sit in private family collections or in public archives without attracting a great deal of attention. Their surfaces seem opaque. The information they offered seems limited. Indeed, nothing in Adolf Blond's school picture, and we, it's, it's here on the bottom, uh, suggests that Adolf and other Jews in the class would become victims of extreme marginalization and genocidal persecution in future years, some of it perhaps perpetrated by fellow classmates with ethnic Romanian or Ukrainian family backgrounds. This was a very multicultural city. And nothing here gives a clue to how, around 1900, a Jewish child like Adolf Blond would have ended up in a modern ethnically integrated classroom such as um, the one he was in in the first place. Nothing points back to the religious elementary schools, the Hararim, or the Talmudic academies, the Yeshivot, that his grandfather and great-grandfather would have attended probably 50 or 100 years earlier in one of the shtetlach or towns in the nearby region. The assimilationist journey that brought Adolf Blond to this state elementary school for boys in Chernovitz on the outer limits of the Austro-Habsburg Empire was mirrored in a number of other imperial settings around, across the world around the very same time. And this is what we would like to talk about today. So for example, what you see here is a late 19th century school photograph from a Catholic mission school in, 19th century, in, in, in India. <coughs> And here are three photographs taken in Sierra Leone um, in the 1890s in Freetown, which was the capital of this British West African colony. And uh, these are photographs of descendants of liberated slaves in a class at the Anglican Church Mission, sponsored by Fora Bay College, the first European-style university in West Africa. And the third is um, a photograph of a, the women's division at the Methodist Mission, sponsored by Newtown West School. And you see, of course, that these pictures look quite similar to each other. 
So if we examine the school picture of Adolf Blond alongside these other images, as well as alongside, as you see here, the extensive archive of school photos taken in the United States from the 1860s onward of American Indian and African American children, much can become visually and conceptually clearer to us about Adolf Blond's photo. We can begin to appreciate the important ideological role that photography played in a global project of cultural and often also religious conversionism that was taking place in different imperial contexts and, um, and somewhat different time frames from the 1780s to the early 20th century. This ideological function um, of assimilationism emerges most clearly, as we shall see, in well-known images, such as the ones you see here, from two boarding schools um, that were set up after the conclusion of the American Civil War to educate African American and American Indian children. So on the one hand, the Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and the Hampton Institute, the Hampton Normal and Ag Agricultural Institute in Hampton, Virginia. So, and we'll talk a little more about this and the importance that photography played in the project of these schools. The predominant way to publicly display what was deemed the success of the boarding school experience um, that assimilated and integrated these children um, was through before and after images, as you see here. Calculated portrayals of the students and their background in so-called degeneracy before the so-called civilizing process of American, Americanization affected them. Um, and, and also then afterwards, when school officials wanted to show that their curricular and cultural conversionist project had indeed taken effect, then this is what you see here. So these explicit before and after images reveal something that is present, but actually imperceptible in seemingly ethnically integrated European class photos from the 1900s, uh, such as Adolf Blond's. So in Adolf Blond's photos, what we see here is unnoticeable because the trajectory of Jewish emancipation and induced transformation in Habsburg Imperial Europe and also in other parts of Western Europe began to unfold almost a half century before photography developed in that era, and uh, in that region, and thus before it could be used to visually document and display the external changes that had occurred. But as we will see, cultural conversionism is not really a linear story with measurable befores and afters. So what we want to develop here is um, the concept of assimilation uh, and assimilationism. The, this concept has often been associated with the educational process of cultural transformation and social integration in which schools obviously play a key role. But assimilation has been theorized as an absolute, all-inclusive, and unidirectional move into a hegemonic state culture, as an undertaking that severs those children whom it involves from the pull of alternative identifications. But we want to argue that um, it would be better to understand this concept more broadly and multidirectionally as a set of encounters, sometimes coercive, but also characterized by subtle interpolation and adaptation involving conformity, mimicry, and incorporation, as well as resistance and refusal. Such an understanding would take into account both the historical context and the social climate in which ethnocultural contact and transformation take place. It would bring to the surface assimilationist enticements and pressures on the one hand, but also counterforces and challenges to this process. And as we've been thinking about this, we found that school pictures are actually very interesting documents through which to study the process of assimilation. Because as group images that depict multiple subjects with different individual histories, with different psychologies, with different family histories, different attitudes, school photos um, can somehow instruct us to the variegated textures of assimilationism and social change. They elicit what the photography theorist Ariela Azulay has called a civil gaze. 
And she says it, the, a civil gaze is a gaze in which the photographed person addresses the spectator as a member of a shared citizenry. And she, she develops this notion in contradistinction to the kinds of empathic or sympathetic gazes that we think photos of perhaps poor children or uh, disadvantaged others demand of us. Uh, Susan Sontag wrote this book uh, uh, regarding the pain of others, and she's asking, what do photos of painful populations that have suffered, suffering populations demand of their viewer? Is it sympathy? Is it empathy? Well, Azulai says, no, let us, look, let us think of us as members of a shared citizenry, and then how would we want to be looking at each other? And it's a very interesting concept through which to discuss school pictures in particular. So in school photos, we would argue, a civil gaze would enable a viewer to recognize how social cohabitation among different groups can take shape, as in the photo of Adolf Blond, for example, but also how such cohabitation might turn into oppression, into persecution, and into radical separation. Indeed, it's a civil gaze, it's the civil gaze that, that they elicit that makes school photos pri privileged objects in reflecting on the contradictions that structure the process of assimilation. Each photo, we would say, can be read as a snapshot of a moment in this process, revealing the pushes and pulls, revealing the ascents and descents, the gains and losses, as well as the multiple erasures that define assimilationism's fraught, recursive, and distinctly nonlinear trajectory. So if we think of it as a snapshot, we might think of each of these children being in a somewhat different relationship to this process that they're in. And then you would see that they might be telling multiple stories about such a process. So this is just the, by way of introduction to the two lectures that we'll be giving here, and um, which are part of a larger project on school photography and the roles that this genre has played at several different historical moments in time. It's a, um, as we said, it's a, it, it's a genre that, um, that really hasn't attracted a lot of critical attention, but it's one of the genres of vernacular photography that's actually intriguing and can be used to study particularly this process. So what we want to do tonight is uh, consider a number of late 19th and early 20th century images and accounts from schools that educate Jews in Central Europe, as well as from institutions that were set up to transform and civilize indigenous and African American children in North America. So this comparative and connective lens and the pervasive genre of school photography um, will allow us, we hope, to highlight specific aspects of modern European Jewish experience. But at the same time, of course, we're eager not to obscure important differences in the modern histories of Indians, blacks, and European Jews, and between the chronology and ideology of assimilationism that affected them in different ways. And on Wednesday, Wednesday is our second lecture, right? So in the second lecture, we want to look at uh, a very different moment uh, when assimilation, assimilationism has gone wrong, um, the, the moment of the Second World War in Europe and we want to look at photos that highlight precisely the underside of assimilationism, exclusion, ghettoization, and genocide. The ironies that emerge as we confront this genre of photography from these very two different historical moments and ideological regimes come into view even more forcefully in the work of a number of contemporary artists who reframe comment and complicate school photos in their creative works. And we'll talk about a number of these artistic installations in both of the lectures. So why school photos? Most often, um, school photos are taken by commercial photographers with seemingly few, if any, artistic aspirations and little desire to deviate from formulaic representations. Uh, I'm sure you've all been in that scene of school photography, stand up straight, you know, the, the shorter children are in front, the taller ones are in back. It's not, um, it's, it's, it's not very, a very complicated genre, but actually there are a number of exceptions and we'll talk about a couple of these. 
So school photos share many of the same features. Usually they depict a group of students that are standing or sitting on benches or by their desks or some of, sometimes sitting or standing outdoors in rows. They often face forward and looking at the photographer. And, but less conventionally, they also can um, portray scenes of instructions, generally posed and performed for the camera. You, they show children learning, as you see in these photos. The photographer and the camera setup are instrumental in arranging the assemblage, which is often focused around a centrally placed teacher whose presence, like that of the photographer, serves as a kind of disciplining force and joining the children to assume postures and gazes that demonstrate their, their acquiescence to an imposed group identity. So in this regard, of course, the specific institutional and larger national matrix into which every school, and by extension every school class is embedded, plays a key ideological role. Schools are accredited by a municipality or by the state and thus, they are the institutions that teach children to read and to write, and that provide them with elements of a national literary and scientific culture, and especially of its versions of history. They're also the sites that instruct students in rules of acceptable behavior and morality, that tutor them in civic responsibility and patriotism, that instill respect for authority and the established economic order. In addition, schools reflect pedagogies of social life, they can impart useful lessons about difference, differences in race, class, gender, religion, and ethnicity. And while they might be aided, or in many cases also impeded in these tasks of ideological and civic inculcation by other institutions, by the family, for example, by the law, by media, uh, by the arts, schools are the central agencies that shape and reinforce values, outlooks, beliefs, and myths that constitute citizenship in the society in which they are located. Indeed, inasmuch as they are accredited by the state, I would say even private schools that are dedicated to the education of economically uh, more privileged children or children of a particular ethnic group or a religious group um, conform to this general ideological role. And in Michel Foucault's term, school, schools discipline bodies and minds to fit into a de um, dominant hegemonic order. So what's the role of school photos? Well, we would say that, uh, and you might recognize somebody there in the second row on your right. Um, talk about disciplining into the dominant hegemonic order in 1950s Romania. Um, so what's their role? We would say that photos such as this one, like school re report cards, like diplomas, can be considered a form of certification that's uh, available to everyone who's portrayed. It's a confirmation of grade level, of grade ascendancy, of participation in a trajectory of socialization that defines group as well as national belonging and citizenship. So in that sense, each image is both a form and an instrument. It's visual evidence of a commonality among the children in a class that attempts to minimize or erase differences that shape social life outside the school, as well as social life inside the school. It reinforces forms of conformity and standardization, already made evident in the mandated wearing of school uniforms and in regulated dress and hair codes. In that sense, differences among the children in religion or ethnicity, in sociability, in creativity, in intelligence, differences between compliant and rebellious children are obscured by the conventions of the photograph. And you see here the commonality, the, the red communist um, scarf, but some children did not earn, earn it, so we also perceive differences, and these differences are certified by the picture. Um, but it, so in, in that sense, school photographs and the camera with which they're taken do more than certify a step in a trajectory of ideological incorporation, however textured by marks of difference. They constitute institutional acts of interpolation, as well as the social processes that support and that also contest these. 
Like all photographs, school pictures have the capacity to capture and document contradictions that the conventionality and uniformity of poses of middle distance camera angles and institutional sanctions would seem to exclude. Like every group picture, there's a lot going on. Often photos like these don't survive because they would be, you know, something more conventional would be substituted. But um, because they assemble a number of diverse individuals, they can inscribe a greater range of affects, of gestures and meanings than the photographer would have intended to convey or that the event of the image would have accommodated. These excesses, often subversive and resistant, such as here, are part of the multifaceted pedagogies of sameness and difference that school photographs represent. So in a sense, a, large, a complex network of information and meanings can emerge from school photos if we examine them not only from the point of view of the photographer and the institution and the single point perspective that, that, that represents that institution, but also from that of their subjects, from the children and the teachers, and that of their viewers around the time when they were first taken and later. And it's this multiplicity of meanings, what um, again Ariela Azulay calls the heterogeneous knowledge of photographs, that makes them such valuable documents of social and civic life, and consequently such important memorial objects in the aftermath of destruction. Do you want to move? OK. So let me talk a little bit about school photos and Jewish emancipation. And that's what it says up there. Sorry, you can't read that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> On the surface, as Mariana indicated, the class in Chernovitz and Adolf Blond's 1900 picture seems rather homogeneous. When we, as distant spectators located in another place, in another time, view it or from out of you other early 20th century photos from Central European schools with sizable Jewish enrollments, it is not easy to discern significant social or economic or religious differences in the depicted children. Nor for that matter do any of these photos seem to yield much historical information beyond what becomes apparent from styles of dress, from external appearance, background details. They don't show the long transformative, uh, uh, transformative trajectory of cultural, of political, of economic change of which Blonde and the other Jewish children are products. By the time his school photograph was snapped in 1900, Jewish emancipation and adoption of bourgeois cultural standards had been in process for more than a century. The Jewish children had already been enrolled, educated, and ideologically inculcated in mixed group state controlled schools for generations. To perceive the scale of change for Jews in this Habsburg imperial region of Europe, we actually have to begin in the late 18th century, many decades before the emergence of modern photography, with Emperor Joseph II's 1781 promulgation of what he called an Edict of Tolerance, containing far-reaching reform measures lifting restrictions against Jews. These measures were enhanced in increments until Habsburg Jews finally realized full political, legal, and political rights as Austrian citizens in the 1860s and 1870s. But it is important to stress that this particular instant or instance of emancipation and of cultural transformation, which was sort of induced from above, was but one manifestation of a much larger 19th century Euro-American phenomenon affecting many different minorities and colonized populations. Facilitated by the widespread expansion of industrial capitalism, yet often also earned through bloody struggle, through confrontation, various groups that were deeply submerged in the strata of society also gained freedom from confining legal and social disabilities and entered into the modern world. The liberation of slaves in Europe 
and the Americas, the elimination of the remnants of serfdom, the emancipation of the Catholic minority in the United Kingdom, the beginnings of the struggle for women's rights, all were also milestones attesting to the emancipatory flow of this era of change. What motivated these transformations? In a number of instances, they were imposed from the top down, as we said, by imperial or governmental authorities wishing to integrate subjected and colonized peoples into a more effectively controlled centralized state. That was certainly the case in Habsburg, Austria in the 18th century. Joseph II's Edict of Tolerance was conceived as one of a series of reform measures that would transform the Habsburg Empire into a unified and centralized entity through the elimination of local particularisms and through the barriers that were created by estates, corporations, denominations. He wanted to do away with these things. In other cases, the transformations were mobilized by liberal thinkers rooted in the rational ideas of the Enlightenment who, actually, who actively toiled to improve the life conditions of subordinated and downtrodden groups and who wished to incorporate them with greater freedom into the dominant societies. Everywhere, however, liberal and other reformers expected, and this is important, not only expected but indeed demanded that the members of emancipated populations adopt and conform to the values, to the outlooks, and to the ways of the emancipators. Before they could hope for a degree of civil acceptance in the world of the sovereign, the so-called, and this is the term of use, culturally backward, the inferior subjects, needed to be modified and transformed. The words that were used, they needed to be uplifted, they needed to be bettered, they needed to be improved from their previously degraded character and existence. The belief was that culturally induced uh, backward ways of living, uh, of thinking, and of worshiping needed to be erased and replaced. Personal names, language, <laughs> dress, physical appearance, three aspects of personal identity were everywhere central to the transformations demanded from subordinated groups. To make Jews conform more closely to the, and to register them more effectively, for example, Habsburg officials mandated that Jews adopt a German surname. Jews throughout all of the Germanic lands were also induced to replace what some ridiculed as their laughable jargon, uh, Yiddish or Judendeutsch it was called, with German, and they were also prompted to change their external appearance. Rich Deutsch Klein, for example, to dress in German style, was presented and encouraged as the model of acceptable attire in society, the preferable alternative to the clothing, to the traditional head and hair covering, and general outward presentation of so-called traditional Jews. Now, arguably, the transformative ideology supporting the emancipation and movement into class society of Jews, and subsequently of black Americans, of Indians, and of colonized groups uh, all over the world, was not uh, technically racist uh, in a biological gen genetic sense. It was, after all, granted that the, it was possible for these so-called degraded people to change, to become more like us. Uh, both the ideology, but the ideology, while it wasn't technically racist, was unequivocally culturally chauvinistic. It rested on the contrasts that were drawn between notions of backwardness of degradation, as it was called, I'm using those words that they, were, that, that they were actually used, of deficiency and their opposites, civilization and progress. Schools were the principal instruments by which social reformers hoped to bring about uplifting transformation. In the Habsburg realm, the recasting, again, one of the terms that was used, occurred institutionally by requiring Jewish children to attend state-controlled schools. 
These schools, as Jacob Katz uh, has noted in his uh, very wonderful book about uh, assimilation, emancipation of Jews, uh, were instrumental in breaking the hold of the religious elementary schools of the Talmudic and, uh, and of the Talmudic academies of, of the yeshivot. They instructed Jewish children in German, and they exposed them to the literatures, to the subjects, to the views of the world that, that, that had previously really been denied to all but the wealthiest, the most privileged among them. There were, of course, push and pull dynamics that energized this process. Penalties, often very harsh for non-cooperation and non-compliance, but also rewards uh, in the form of greater physical and social mobility and increased rights and material and economic benefits if one transformed. Unquestionably, the changes induced by assimilationism were not intended to bring about social equality or eliminate power differences among the rulers and the ruled. Nonetheless, significant countercurrents also affected the dynamics of the process. There were always reactionary and often racist blockages by officials and citizens who were unsympathetic to emancipation and assimilation. There were also resistances from old order religious and political authorities who rightly perceived the challenges of such changes posed to their own order. In the Habsburg rural provinces, for example, uh, Orthodox and Hasidic Jews resisted the prescribed secular education of Jewish youth, as well as the centralizing imperial policies that limited the autonomy of Jewish communal organizations. Many younger Jews, however, especially those in cities like, like Vienna or Prague or Chernovitz or Lvov, were, uh, who were most exposed to Austro-German cultural influences through, through their schooling, many of them took advantage of the uh, opportunities that were being offered by the, newly graded emancipatory, by the newly granted emancipatory rights. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, these urban Jews who were Germanized in language and culture increasingly moved into bourgeois and, pro and, the, and into the bourgeois and professional realm of class society. They came to view themselves as representatives of an Austrian-German Kulturreich and as agents of the Austro-Habsburg imperial mission. Uh, they, they thought of themselves as agents in the, uh, the colonized east of this. One could certainly uh, argue or posit that many of, this, of their school photos from the early 20th century reflect the sense of incorporation and of, in a sense, what seems to many of them perhaps successful incorporation. Let me switch for a minute to school photos and Americanization. In the United States, photos of school classes appear astoundingly early within the history of photography, testifying really to the significance of this unremarked photographic genre. Perhaps the earliest one that's surviving is a daguerreotype, uh, I'm sorry that it didn't come out that well in the, in the projection, which is now kept at the Princeton University Archives and is most probably of the Princeton class of 1843. It is not until the early 1860s, however, with the development of collodion and albumin glass plate processes of photography, which permitted large format printing and sharp detail and tonal variation, but most revolutionary of all, per permitted reproducibility. The photographs could now be reproduced and handed out or sold. Or uh, it's, it's at that point that school fo photographs become part of the repertoire of uh, uh, offerings of professional photographers. Around 1865, what may be the first photograph of American Indian, of Tulalip school children in school uniforms are taken together with their Catholic preschoolmasters in at that point the Washington Territory in what becomes Washington State, and that made its appearance. And this is in all likelihood uh, this picture, I think, represents one of the first examples of the ideological use 
of school photos to display this process of assimilation of cultural, uh, and for, in this case, religious conversion in the direction of the dominant Anglo-Americanization. The shaping role of photography in the U.S. assimilationist project, which was not present in the early period of Jewish emancipation, is best illustrated in the numerous photographs that were taken at the Carlisle Indian School that Mariana mentioned and the Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute. Like Habsburg state schools assimilating the empire's minorities, these boarding schools were specifically established to be transformative institutions. They were U.S. congressional and state chartered instruments for what was defined as the betterment, again, the same that, that word is used, of Native and African American young people. As George Wilson, who was a commentator on Indian affairs, indicated in 1882 in the Atlantic Monthly, and I quote him, the kind of education they, the Indians, are in need of is one that will habituate them to the customs and advantages of a civilized life and cause them to look with feelings of repugnance on their native state, unquote. And the unabashed terms of the Carlisle founder, the founder of the Carlisle Institute, Richard Henry Pratt, uh, he said, by means of boarding schools, the government must, and this is the words he used, the government must kill the Indian and save the man. So schools were, used, were designed to kill the Indian, save the man. The Carlisle Indian School and the Hampton Institute provided a combined academic and practical education. Basic tools like reading, writing, and the spoken English language were taught to give young Indians and blacks access to what were termed the civilized world of books and the civilized branches of knowledge, uh, arithmetic, science, history, and the arts. These would provide knowledge and skills they would need on the road to further integration into the body politic at some point in the future. But after arriving at the schools, both Indian and black children also underwent harsh corporate dis uh, uh, corporeal discipline. Killing the Indian involved giving them forcible haircuts, cutting their hair short, making them doff, making them take off their indigenous clothing and bodily de decorations brought from their ancestral homelands and reservations in exchange for school uniforms. Children were also numbered and renamed. They gave us government lace-up shoes and they gave us a couple pair of black stockings and long underwear, about a couple of them, and slips and a dress. Then they gave us a number. My number was always 23. So I recalled one of the school graduates. <coughs> I've always hated that name. It was forced on me as though I had been an animal, recalled another. Hair cutting embodied a especially painful form of humiliation as the Kala Sa, a Lakota woman, stressed in her memoir, and I quote, I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Christianization was endorsed at Carlisle and Hampton, but it was not actively promoted in the way that it was at missionary-run institutions in the reservations, or elsewhere in the US for that matter. Instead, Carlisle and Hampton fostered sobriety and mental discipline, and, uh, and, and, and attempted to really instill the productive skills uh, and ethics of industrial and domestic work, two of the cornerstones of Euro-American industrial and capitalist ethos. Additionally, in what officials sometimes term citizenship training, they, they, they try to inculcate a version of a U.S. national historical narrative that included justifications, actually, for the, just, for the westward sweep of U.S. empire, 
and the dispossession of Indian lands, for the victories of so-called civilization over savagery. At the same time, however, the actual fact that boarding schools like Hampton or like Carlisle were set up exclusively or largely exclusively for Indian and for black youth who in a sense perhaps received in some cases equal uh, curricular offerings and quality of instruction. Some of the instruction was not bad. But they were always separate from academic and industrial training institutions that were attended by whites. And so that could not have but, but, but uh, escaped the notice of many of the students. They, 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 they obviously picked this up. Although some, like Booker T. Washington, who was a graduate of Hampton, embraced the ideas of schooling as a form of social betterment, and some parents sent their children off hoping for better food, healthy nourishment, some people were, of course, extremely impoverished, and they thought the schools would give them those food. Gave them pep, they thought they might get better, greater social possibilities. There were, there were always significant and devastating counter narratives. Uh, narratives about coercion, some of which I've already told you, of abuse, of militarized and oppressive discipline, and also of resistance and refusal. All of these emerged in interviews and in writings of, from boarding schools. It was very difficult for me at first, one tells us, for students at the school were not allowed to speak in the language of the Indians. At the time, I understood nothing else. At Carlisle, children were isolated from the, from the outside world by a six-foot high fence, and their behavior was continually watched from the panoptical vantage point of a bandstand at the center of the, of the grounds. You see it right there in the image, right? Intimidation were very much, and fear were very much present in our lives, recalled another one. We would cower from the abusive disciplinary practice of some superior. The school's disciplinary and restrictive measures were countered in some cases by some children's efforts to escape, by acts of resistance, of vandalism. But, there, but all of these actions also led the quite often to severe dejection, to illness, occasionally to death, even to suicide. To be sure, some Indian students also eventually managed to what they called turn the power. They developed a group consciousness and, a communal, and communal feelings that would, over the years, have important consequences for the development of a pan-Indian uh, identity in the U.S. So that's, that's the, the flip side and the more positive side of what comes out of this. From the earliest days, photographic images were used as an integral part of the assimilationist project of which the children were subject. The founders of Carlisle and Hampton, the uh, uh, Colonel Samuel Armstrong, Captain Richard Pratt, who we've mentioned before, both were retired military officers who had commanded black troops during the Civil War. And both hired professional photographers to illustrate the students' Americanization. As Pratt explained in an 1880 letter to US Representative Thaddeus Pound, an important congressional supporter of his school, and I quote the letter by Pratt, I send you today a few stereo views of the Indian youth here. These were very popular stereophonic photographs just coming out at that time, so the three-dimensional photographs. You will note that they come mostly as blanket Indians. A very large proportion of them had never been inside a schoolroom. I'm grateful to report that they have yielded gracefully to discipline. Isolated as these Indian youth are from the savage surroundings of their homes, they lose their tenacity to savage life and give themselves up to learning. Hundreds of photos were taken of the students in large and small groups, in class activities and individually, and reproduced on postcards and in stereographic format. The intended audience for these images were members of Congress and the presidential administration. Uh, these are agencies, obviously, that were central in providing funding for the institutions. 
but also the general public and philanthropic agencies, as well as Indian notables back in the reservations, <coughs> persons needed to support the ongoing transportation of Indian youth eastwards, hundreds of even thousands of miles from the ancestral homelands. It is this purpose that the before and after photos serve so well. We wish a variety of photographs of the Indians. Samuel Armstrong of Hampton advised, again, Richard Pratt in, uh, in a note. Be sure and have them bring their wild, barbarous things. This will show whence we started. The many personal and scholarly accounts of the schools themselves tend not to discuss the children's specific feelings about being photographed. I mean, you know, I've, read, I've I've noted some of the feelings about the being in school. Though, though there was, there's a very famous poem by uh, the African-American Hampton graduate Paul Lawrence Dunbar. It's a poem called We Wear the Mask. And he does testify to the effects that structured uh, these, these uh, emotions, these feelings. So this is Dunbar, just a little piece of his, of his poem, We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. A number of the images, and particularly those taken by, a number of the images, particularly those taken by uh, the photographer Francis Benjamin Johnson, and they were subsequently collected and exhibited uh, as the Hampton album, and were then promoted as a national, as a U.S. national sh uh, showpiece at the 1900 Universal Exposition in Paris, uh, the 1900 World Exposition in Paris. These diverge from conventional uh, uh, sort of format of these, fo of these photos, the most, uh, uh, of the most certified of these genres, and they, and they allow us to, to give us a sort of counter uh, to the, to the occlusions and invisibilities that enabled the process of assimilationism. Uh, and we can see a kind of counter-narrative coming out of these photographs. Johnson was one of the uh, first female photojournalists in the U.S. And she also then became a noted studio photographer in Washington, D.C. And she was hired uh, to do these Hampton photographs uh, in, in, the, in the late 1890s. Uh, she used artistic staging to create an iconography that, that greatly expanded and elucidated the school photo genre. Many of her photographs were shot from the side rather than from the front angles, as you can note, and portray scenes of instructions and learning that constitute explicit performances. Each one of these is a kind of performance of the assimilationist process of Americanization. There are often extended empty foregrounds do not draw the viewer in, but uh, they elicit what the, uh, the author James uh, Giman has termed a distant paternalistic gaze, a gaze that can only be countered with the civil gaze that Mariana mentioned, uh, that we, and it's only that that we allow us to see these in a slightly different way. There's one famous picture called Saluting the flag at the Whittier Primary School. The Whittier Primary School was the elementary uh, school subsidiary of the Hampton Institute. This is an excellent example of a distant wide angle side view that Johnson took that reveals the overt staging of Americanization at work. Placed, as you can see, in a kind of choreographed triangular uh, formation, the young students here and their teachers uh, dressed in dark or white uniforms, all raise their right hand in a flag salute while the left hand hangs down by their side. A little boy facing the multitude holds up a giant American flag, that a uh, U.S. flag that dominates the domesticated outdoor landscape. In saluting the flag and raising their hand, these black children carry out a symbolic act of patriotic citizenship, of generalized transformation from the chattel slavery of their forebears into members of a national American body politic. 
Ironically, of course, they performed this in a school that was totally devoted to their racially separated education. Class in American history is an amazing <laughs> photo <laughs> that she took. Uh, it is probably the most blatantly revealing of all of her images. Here, you see orderly black and Indian students in uniforms, and the, the, the male students were all uh, dressed in sort of post-Civil War military-type uniforms in this school. They're studying history by looking at several displays prepared for their instruction. You see a stuffed American eagle. I don't know if you can see it very well on the left-hand side. A stuffed American eagle. A Frederick Remington picture uh, print on the wall, which is depicted, of course, again, a U.S. cavalry raid on Indian territory, and a, li and, uh, a, a live Indian in tribal regalia. Now, these are Indian children and black children looking at this live Indian. Laura Wexler, who has written insightfully about Johnson, about uh, the photographer and the Hampton work that she produced, called this photograph a virtual maelstrom of, conf of conflicting currents. The contradictions of class in, uh, in American history cannot escape even the most casual viewers employing a civil gaze. Visually, it relegates the violent reality of American expansionism, the Remington print in the background, to a background proposition while foregrounding visual evidence of the transformative success of assimilationism. When Native American children can look at an Indian on display in full Native regalia as an illustrative object of a history lesson, then their process of cultural alienation would seem complete. This image certainly belies the structure of the before and after by exposing in some way how everyone in the tableau is framed uh, and certified or, or objectified within a narrative that is not in any way linear. The trajectory of assimilationism is both preceded uh, uh, by, by uh, imperial persecution, murder, and genocide, but also followed by instrumentalization here. Presenting Johnson's Hampton album at the 1900 World Fair as an exhibition of American modernity can in no way belie the human costs and the occlusions of the mythology of progress that the technology of photography was mobilized to foster. But perhaps through heterogeneous knowledge, they can also elicit, uh, that photographs can also elicit, we can perhaps expose these contradictions as we go on. So I think one thing that this image shows us is that uh, there is no before and after because the children who are looking at the Indian are equally instrumentalized and objectified. Um, by the image them itself and then by its uh, presentation at the Paris exhibition as the example of what American progress looks like. So as we've seen, um, the photographic archives of these projects to assimilate subordinated others, Jews in Central Europe on the one hand and indigenous and African American children in the US are really quite different and you might wonder what we're doing, putting them together. Jewish assimilation through schooling was not blatantly propagandized um, I as the movement to civilize black and civilize black and Indian children in the US was, um, nor was the Habsburg assimilationist regime as totalizing or as violent. And yet, I think if we return to the much more conventional and thus also seemingly unremarkable images of Jewish school children from the early 20th century, after looking at the pictures from Hampton and Carlisle, I think they begin to reveal more than we perceive at first glance. True, these are not images from rural residential boarding schools um, as those others were, 
Um, they're pictures from integrated, mostly urban schools in which it is actually difficult to detect which children might belong to Jewish or to other minorities, whether persecuted or tolerated. Though ethnic, ethnic distinctions are largely invisible, Adolf Blond is surrounded by ethnic Romanian, Ukrainian, and Austrian classmates in the multicultural city of his birth, and we know that. Just as in this image, which is a picture of my aunt, uh, my mother's sister's class, um, she is standing in the back row, second from your right, um, from your left, surrounded by classmates we know from other Chernov of Chernovitz's ethnic groups. But if you look at this picture, all the young women here, just like the girls from Carlisle and Hampton, have donned their uniforms. They've learned to assume the postures that are proper to young womanhood, fold their hands, keep their legs together, assent to the bodily regime that's demanded by the discipline of schooling, enforced by the central teacher, and also reinforced by the camera. Many have learned to blend in, to erase their differences, to aspire to full integration, maybe even to believe that they've achieved it. Um, but though ostensibly integrated in the space of the school, the Jewish children in these pictures were no less objects of social separation and discrimination than the black and Indian girls and boys from Hampton and Car Carlisle. And we know, of course, that those who embraced and those who contested the assimilationist project in Central Europe, those who integrated and converted, and, though, and those who developed alternative affiliations and ideologies ranging from diaspora nationalism to Zionism, all of them equally became targets of the genocidal campaign that would erupt in the very near future, a future toward which these children were looking as they faced the camera. I mean, we believe that you can learn a lot about um, archival photographs by seeing what artists do with them. And we want to spend just a little time to look at three contemporary artists, really two, but, um, and it says afterlives up there, sorry, that got cut off, at the afterlives of some of these images in the work um, of contemporary artists. Because a number of contemporary artists have reframed school pictures and thereby have been able to mobilize their political and historical meanings uh, for a very different present. So artists like Stephen Dale, who made the, form, the early picture in this one, and also Carrie Mae Weems, have responded specifically and scathingly to the assimilationist convergenist messages conveyed by the Carlisle and Hampton photographs. They've used these very photographs in their installations. So in a sense, what they're doing is use the images against themselves to tell an alternative history and to open up the photograph's multiple effective registers. Carrie Mae Weems' large installation piece that's called The Hampton Project, was, which, uh, which was first exhibited in 2000 at Williams College, the alma mater of Hampton Institute's founder, Colonel Samuel Chapman Armstrong, is a deconstruction of Francis Johnston's Hampton album. And it's also an indictment of the legacy of oppression, of deleted traditions, and dashed hopes that are unacknowledged or suppressed within the Hampton album. And it's an indictment of, the his of historical erasure more generally. Weems selected from among Johnston's Hampton album, Hampton photographs, but she also chose, among others, pictures of Ku Klux Klan parades celebrating white supremacy, white missionaries baptizing Native Americans, blacks sprayed with fire hoses by police to break up civil rights demonstrations in the 1960s. And in doing so, she created large sepia-toned wall prints and prints on free-hanging diaphanous Muslim banners. Using captions and texts that as overlays for these, as well as poetic audio commentaries in her own voice, she provided ironic observations on before and after photographic depictions of the assimilationist success. The bloody before histories that she tells are histories of initial contacts between Euro-Americans and Native Americans and, Af and African peoples, the history of slavery, of westward expansion and Indian land dispossession, 
And for, in the after category, Weems includes Jim Crow era and civil rights conflicts of the 20th century. None of these escape her beautiful but eminently unsettling creative endeavor. Nor does the fact that despite all transformative promises that are implicit in assimilation, the children depicted in the Hampton School photos would remain subjects at, and at best only second class citizens of a nation in which they lived. They were made literate in English and educated in a Euro-American worldview to be sure, but for the most part, they would also remain subordinated and regimented workers, serving to assure whites of the continuing hegemony of an economic, cultural, and political value system from which they were largely excluded. Weems's critique of the school's founding philosophy is so scathing that in fact, the Hampton University famously canceled the scheduled opening of the exhibit on its grounds. So let me now switch to an artist you might know, um, the French artist Christian Boltanski, who, like Weems, has developed a resonant aesthetic of an aftermath. He has used class photos to forge a distinctive post-Holocaust idiom of memory and mourning. And this picture we return to that you noticed before because it is so unusual and funny. Um, it's a picture from a school class in Vienna's largely, second, uh, largely Jewish second district in the 1930s. And this picture served as the basis for Boltanski's installations that he called Lessons of Darkness. With its eye-catching antics, this image certainly contrasts with the many class photos where individuality and difference have been suppressed for the sake of uniformity and group identity. The student in the center in the top row acts out in a humorous, acts out a humorous scenario, but several other boys also display irreverence. And meanwhile, as you can see, their teacher remains serious and almost dour in the middle of the front row. Voltansky has used this image in a number of his installations. And what he does is crop out individual images uh, of the group photo and enlarge them to a point where they almost lose their resolution. And then he sets them into new groupings on walls, he mounts them on biscuit boxes, and he illuminates sometime them sometimes quite aggressively using simple incandescent light bulbs with conspicuously exposed electrical cords. In fact, I once um, helped curate an exhibit where we installed one of Boltanski's um, installations and somebody said, well, we have to hide these cords. And, but of course, the, the people installing it said we have to hide these cords. But of course, the cords are in large part the point because it's hard to evade the association here with the interrogation lamp and the industrial um, uh, aspects of the Holocaust. When we talked to Boltanski about his installations, he said, School, um, school photos are, class photos, he said, are inherently so sad. We look at one of them and we know someone has failed, someone has not lived up to her promise, someone has died. This is a general comment about class photos, but in these, we have the labels. And the label says Vienna, and some of them, some of them are from Paris in the 1930s, the date, 1930s. This inherent sadness becomes grounded and compounded by our historical knowledge of the events that were facing these children that were to come as these children, after these children faced the camera. So nothing explicit connects these installations to the Holocaust, and yet Boltanski's become probably one of the best known post-Holocaust artists. But he clearly says, my work is not about the Holocaust, it is after. And in that aftermath, even if, in fact, some of the children portrayed in these photos survived the war and the genocide, they're figured in these images as dead or as marked by a death that they were not supposed to evade. In reframing archival school pictures to reveal the before and the aftermath they already contain, Carrie Mae Weems and Christian Boltanski confirm that, as Ariela Azulay puts it, the event of photography is never over. And next time, we really want to talk about that temporality of the photograph, that event of photography that continues in what we're going to be discussing as, a, as liquid time. And we'll talk about that next time.
And what we want to do is um, have a detailed look at the practices not only of educating Jewish children in the most extreme moments of persecution, um, in hiding, in ghettos, and even in concentration camp during the seven, Second World War, but also of photographing those practices, which is the most astounding, they're some of the most astounding class photos that we've ever seen. And then of using these photographs in new artistic installations. So that's next time. Thank you.